<clears throat> okay, it's now recording and started. Okay. Oh, hey. Well, Derek Shea is here. That's um, okay. I guess we'll let we'll let in the. Can we let in the attendees? Too? Yeah, you're a co-host, so if you want oh, to, right. then you should be able That's to. That's fine. And I'll just stay the host until Jason appears. Okay. Oh, Jason's here. Oh, okay. I'll promote it. Could you make Jason like the host maybe? Yep, yeah, absolutely. That's what I was going to do. Okay, great. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Wow, we have hey, a big, hey, we have a big people in the audience. I mean, I'm happy um, to elevate anybody who wants to be, you know, a panelist and be able to see everybody if people want to raise their hands for that, because right now we have 12 attendees. And um, so I'll just promote people. And Jason is here. Hi, Jason. Thank you for um, serving as a facilitator. Okay, Tracy, you and okay. Jason are now in control of the meetings. Okay, so thank you, I Amber. Will leave so you don't have to hear all, right. all the screaming in the background. <laughs> okay, thank you, right, Amber. Have a good okay, meeting. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Okay, Jason, I'm promoting people just. Sorry, yeah, I'm usually just a participant, not a host. Right, well, thank you for um, hosting. I will say that, I don't know if Guilford sent you the information I sent around with the agenda, but because you also, um, facilitated at the December 15th meeting. And one of the things at that meeting was we wanted to see Guilford's spreadsheet. And um, because no, nobody else has the copy of it. So um, uh, if without Guilford, this may be a short meeting. <laughs> yeah, I'm unfortunately. Sorry, I only have the no, that's okay. I asked him what else I needed. Yeah, no. Yeah, so it's like we typically, you know, once a year or so, we just review the list. Um, so I can, I'll just email you what I sent around to the committee. Okay. Um, and hopefully, and we, we do have a quorum of our committee, so we can, I can call that to order in a moment. Um, let me just... Okay, let's see. All right. Sorry, I'm just trying to, okay. Yeah, and I had, I tried to get hold of Guilford last week and I couldn't, I wasn't able to, so. All right. Okay. Um, all right, well, let me call the meeting to order. Um, hold on. Okay, and I mean, and anybody else you wants to join and see everybody, feel free in attendance, you can raise your hand. Um, oh, and Kim is here too. Kim, do you have that statement? Otherwise I can read it about that we have a virtual meeting. You should do it. Okay. I looked it up just the other day. Oh, here I have it. Okay, great. That would be awesome. Um, except that I just, okay. I am in my meeting, sweetie. Yep. Okay. Um, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order, spending certain meetings of the open provision, um, open meeting law, this meeting of the Transportation Advisory Committee of the Town of Amherst is being conducted via remote participation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, so we are joined today by um, Jason Skills because Guilford Mooring was not available to attend today. 
Um, so we do have the first item on the agenda is a public comment period. So at this time, we will entertain any comments from anybody who wants to make any. If you want to raise your hand so we can call on you. Um, uh, Jessica, I think you had your hand up first. I'm sorry if I didn't notice others. I Go ahead. You may unmute. There we go. Um, there are a lot of people here tonight because we want, uh, we are all members of the North Amherst Village Center group that wants to share with you the proposals that we've uh, forwarded to the capital, um, resident capital uh, request. Um, they're all transportation proposals. We want to present them quickly um, so that you know what they are. And um, we, if you have any feedback that you'd like to share with us at this time, um, that would be great because we will be going um, forward to the JCPC, I think that's what it's called, um, with uh, you know, presentations as well. Um, okay, um, so Jessica, before you speak, um, I know that Meg was included on some of the emails I had with Kathy Shane and also with... Um, and also with Sean Mangano. And so mm -hmm. the instructions that I was given is that the TAC, and I shared this with Meg as well, and then um, Kathy Shane recommended that this not come before TAC at this time, is that I was told that the DPW and the town manager and the council will be reviewing the transportation related proposals that they've received to the citizen request form. And, that's, um, and then they will decide which ones to forward to TAC for feedback. I mean, I did give Meg some informal feedback, both when she and I met in person and then also an email. Um, so I guess we have not seen your proposal yet, um, but because of those guidance that I was given, including by Kathy Shane, who is a member of the JCPC, as well as Sean, I don't really, I mean, we can entertain some brief comments, but I wouldn't want that to be. That's all the that majority I, that's... of our meeting. And, and also we have not oh, seen no. <laughs> those materials yet, um, because I guess uh, Meg forwarded them to the TAC email address and then they were never forwarded to us. So we can try to track that down and I can ask for additional information um, um, from Guilford. But. Let, me, let me console you. These are very fast. We just want you to hear, you know, in two sentences, what we want, what we're planning and also um, to get your ideas about what what how they fit into town. So I'm sorry. So has have has Meg shared my informal comments that I already made back uh, to her with um, the sponsors of these four items? I shared that we were not on the agenda. Okay. But we had been encouraged by Kathy to during public comment to let you know that they're there because no, of course. That's sort of background. And that's what we're doing. We're only in the speaking. No, the I understand. Comment. But I know that I had, but Kathy, when I reviewed them, like I did offer some feedback. Um, so I think it would be helpful if you did, even though that was informal feedback and it was just from me alone and not from um, the committee. Like, I feel like it would be helpful to share that. But Great. We, we didn't hear that. What you said. No, I mean the email that you had, that you and I had sent before we met. Right. But, okay. All right. So go ahead, Jessica. Um, may I share my screen because that's fine. That will help. Okay. So these are four pre four uh, proposals. Um, I'm going to speak on one of them. I just wanted to anchor you in the. Um, in the, in the neighborhood so that you understand what it is we're asking for. And um, I'm sorry, if somebody has their um, sound on in the back room, can you please mute yourself? Thank you. Okay. The uh, first one is the Valley Bike Stand up here on Coles Road in front of North Square. Um, the other three have to do with this, our neighborhood down here in Harris and Fisher. And I'm going to talk about the crosswalk that we requested Harris and Fisher. Um, Fisher and Harris Streets, as you can see, uh, cut off the traffic light 
at Pine Meadow, North Pleasant. Um, it, a lot of people walk the, on Fisher and Harris, a lot of people bicycle on Fisher and Harris, and a lot of people drive on Fisher and Harris. I'm gonna talk about the walkers and the, and the uh, bicyclists. Um, in your uh, document, the Amherst Bicycle and Pedestrian Network Plan, um, you have a suggestion that for neighborhoods without sidewalks, which is Fisher and Harris, that they can be drawn on the road, <laughs> essentially, um, to make pedestrian lanes on the road. Um, this will make it possible, if we do that in green, to create a crosswalk at the end of the pedestrian lane across Pine Street to the, to the sidewalk um, along Pine, making uh, pedestrian and bicycle traffic much safer. Um, I don't think that we're going to get people to stop walking on Harris and Fisher streets. Um, so I think we need to do something to make them much safer. Thank you. I'll stop sharing now. Okay, thank you. Great. Okay, so um, Kim, do you want to call on people? Yeah, or? sure. Um, I, no, I, I think Derek Shea had his hand up first or next. <laughs> I'm happy to delay and, and let, let other, I perhaps was second or third to put my hand up, but however you all want to. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't keep very good track. I had other things open, so it was hiding some of you on the screen when I first got this. So um, Lisa, why, Lisa, why don't you go ahead? I would like Derek to speak instead of me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Where is Derek? I don't see. Oh, Derek. Uh, okay. Yes, okay. <laughs> I'm the uh, bald-headed Scottish. I see you. Um, yes, you just spoke. Um, so, uh, yeah, so my name is Derek Shea. I currently reside uh, 31 Harris Street um, in Amherst. Um, this is my, our, our family. We've lived on this street for approximately 23 years. Um, it's a beautiful little uh, L-shaped uh, Harris and Fisher. Um, so one of the issues that we have struggled with over a number of years here is the high volume of uh, what I would call fast cars uh, driving uh, through the sort of L version of, of our neighborhood. Um, this goes back many, many years. Um, and essentially, I think what you would see uh, Harris and Fisher is, is, is a shortcut. Uh, and and I'm, Tracy probably knows much more about if that's what it's called in the, in the vernacular uh, these days, but it's essentially a shortcut. And, and what's the point of a shortcut? I think to get from A to B as quickly as possible, right? You know, we all go to the big Y and CVS or an airport and we try and choose the line that will get us through things as quickly as possible. So essentially what happens in our street is that for a couple of different reasons, uh, one is that uh, quite close by uh, approximately about 200 meters to um, the, the west section of, of, of Harris Street, there's, there's an intersection with five roads that meet together. You're all, I'm assuming, very familiar with these five roads, uh, North Pleasant, uh, Meadow, Sunderland, Montague and Pine. And so over the last, say, four or five years, there's been some adjustments made to the lights there for, for positive reasons, I think, to, to try to allow traffic to turn left and right uh, rather than being stuck. Um, I, I think essentially what's happened is, is that there's been these large tailbacks uh, on Pine Street and Meadow. And subsequently, um, people have started to be, I would essentially guess, frustrated at being held in the Pine Street line. Um, and then essentially start to take a shortcut through uh, onto Harris. They drive uh, rapidly down the 200 meter lane there and then take a right turn uh, onto Fisher and, and move forward at the same rapid pace. Not everyone, but a fairly large number where I think it's developed into a safety issue for uh, drivers, walkers, children, pets, various other things. One other quick thing I'll just add, and others can add to this, is that a bit, again, three, four, five years ago, in a very positive way, the street was repaved. Uh, thank you very much to the town for doing that. Um, I think as probably, and again, I'm sure some of you have expertise in this that I don't have. I think when you have a broken road with lots of potholes and various uh, problems, people are apt to drive slower or more cautiously. <laughs> uh, but with uh, all of this uh, new road that we got, which is beautiful, I see a, a, a rapid pace. I'll leave you with two quick examples. I was coming home from school uh, in the fall, taking a left turn from uh, Pine onto Harris. There had been a large tailback. I think it was a Thursday or Friday. I took a, a left turn onto Harris to drive down to my house, which is probably about 150 meters down the street. I was driving, driving slowly because I saw one of my neighbors up and a car had taken a left turn behind me, subsequently passed me on the road 
because wow. they were clearly looking to make a shortcut. They weren't going to do well in their shortcut if they were stuck behind me because I was driving slowly. So that's one thing that happened. Second thing that happened quite recently was that a driver was driving down a street rather rapidly and was attempting to turn uh, onto Fisher and slid because they were driving so fast into the mailbox or the or the or the the driveway of, of John and B who live in the corner. Um, I think there's a safety issue developing in our street. It's probably been there for a while. Our hope would be that you'd be able to help us in some way, whether it be uh, bumps or whatever it may be, but we need some assistance to help make this change. Excuse my uh, longevity talking. All right, thank you. All right. Um... Uh, Kathleen was definitely had her hand up for a while. Hi, I'm uh, Kathleen Carroll. I'm at 11 Fisher Street. I have been here for 13 years. I was here when the street was uh, bumpy and with potholes. And I have uh, very much appreciated the, the new asphalt, but I, I will tell you that the new asphalt um, has encouraged uh, people to drive much, much faster. And the other thing um, is because they're driving faster and because the road is so smooth, it's quiet and you don't hear the traffic come around the corner. So you could be in your yard and just turn your head and there's a, a speeding car going by. So our um, two streets basically turn into a super highway between 6.30 in the morning and nine in the morning, the rush hour for people going into campus and then rush hour leaving between 2.30 and about 5.30. So just um, a couple of things. I have taken it into my own hands over the years to do my own um, traffic control. For about five years, I repeatedly put out um, black seed, um, bird seed in the road to attract birds and squirrels to the road <laughs> to, to uh, slow down the traffic. I, I have to say that um, in the five years that I did do it, I only killed one squirrel. So um, uh, the other thing that I regularly do is I put out um, orange cones. Um, I, for years, I had done that, especially when my grandchildren were younger and um, they were riding bikes on the street. So um, I am one of the persons who submitted a proposal for uh, a speed hump on Fisher Street, and I'd really like you to consider it. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. And um, Meg? Thank you. Um, Meg Gage, I also live in the village center of North Amherst. Um, and I'd like to speak uh, briefly about the request for a Valley bike station in the Mill District. And let me just quickly remind you uh, which that very much of Amherst planning, the Amherst master plan, as well as the wonderful uh, transportation planning that you all have done over the years, is about village centers. And North Amherst is sometimes overlooked, but I just want to remind you what we have in North Amherst as a village center. We have a post office, a library, a recreation area that has tennis and now pickleball court, swimming pool and a brand new basketball area. We have shops, we have restaurants, we have a high end uh, in the Black Walnut Inn. We have an art gallery that's one of the few in town that features local artists, the survival center. We have both affordable housing and uh, family neighborhoods. Uh, we're on the National Registry of Historic Places. We have Puffer's Pond. We have two co-housing communities and extensive farmland and conservation land that's within a half a mile or less, actually a few hundred yards of the village center. Um, Valley Bikes is a wonderful resource that enables people to ride bikes more who don't have bikes and who want to ride a bike to get from place to place. Everybody knows what they are. The furthest north that Valley Bike Station is at Puffton Village. It's, it's totally uh, inadequate for the huge uh, number of pedestrians and bicycle, potential bicycle riders who live in North Amherst. And it's especially appealing proposal because Beacon, uh, the, the or the company that built the mill district housing has pledged $20,000 toward a match. So it's 
to me, it's an absolute no brainer. We need to help people ride bikes. We need, we have a whole bunch of ideas, by the way, these are just four, but um, if anybody's interested, you can see uh, we had a master plan study group that uh, met uh, multiple times, 15 people. I see Eve, she was part of it. And we made a number of recommendations about pedestrian and bicycle safety that we could share with you if you're interested. But this Valley Bike Station is just a complete no brainer since we, we give up $20,000 if we don't do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Meg. And um, Scott. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Scott Paul. I live on uh, Fisher Street, and I just wanted to quickly comment again about the uh, proposal for uh, speed humps. Um, I've been living there for about seven years, uh, 15 Fisher Street, and uh, we have two younger daughters. So safety is certainly a big concern of ours. Uh, when you look at the vehicle traffic that's happening, uh, Derek has actually acted as a speed bump in one situation where my four-year-old was, uh, you know, traveling up the streets and got away from me. Uh, because I have my one-year-old in my hand. So um, I've had at least two close calls this year um, with my daughters and cars passing us um, extremely high speeds. Um, you know, I, I do have some concerns with the, the proposal, so I just want to make sure that those are, are known. Um, we do have a drainage issue on Fisher Street regardless because of the slope of the land um, and the water running down Hare Street turns onto Fisher. There's no gutters and no... Um, curbs and so it flows into our, our yards and lawns. Um, it's a very difficult situation. The last seven years I've spent studying it, um, getting estimates, and we spent a lot of money uh, grading our lawns, putting in, uh, you know, extending our rain gutters uh, 20 feet away from our house. Uh, we've spent $36,000 um, putting in a drain system to get the water that's hitting the basement walls and the footer um, completely away from the house. So I'm just a little cautious about speed bumps because it can divert water and any change in the condition could potentially flood a neighbor's house or, or, um, or worse. Um, the other thing too is I think we have to think about, of course, careful planning, what type of speed bumps. If they're small yellow ones that you know, get hit by the plows, they, they do look pretty bad and they're, they're rough on the cars. Um, you know, maybe more gentle um, you know, speed humps that are, are bigger and longer and you, know, you can actually bike over would be nice. Um, but I think I'm going to just request thoughtful planning on whoever becomes part of that um, proposal. Um, curbs and drainage is still, so certainly a, an issue. But I don't, you know, I, I want to discourage drivers coming down our street, but I don't want to discourage people from living on our street at the same time. So I think there's this de delicate balance of speed humps to definitely lower the risk of injury to people and animals because you're reducing the number of cars, you're reducing the speed. Um, but also doing it in a very, very, very thoughtful way that doesn't cause more problems. So um, I think Derek too, for, for what he said, I, I definitely uh, echo his exact opinion about the traffic intersection. I won't repeat it, but um, it's backing up on Pine Street. So again, any kind of advice, thought, or um, planning that can be done to help with that intersection and our streets would be much appreciated. Thank you. Thanks. And Lisa, sorry, go for it. Hi, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. My name is Lisa Pierce Boniface. I live at 30 Harris Street and um, I moved here 16 years ago with my husband um, and our little daughter who was who had her first birthday in our house. Uh, we moved to this street just because of what Derek said was that lovely L. This is one of those unique streets in Amherst where you don't have a busy street. And over the years, as you can see from this call, Many of us are very close as neighbors because our, especially on Harris Street, you can almost feel like our front yards are a big football field because we've always felt that it was easy for us to go over to the neighbors, just like walk over there. Our kids would run over to each other's homes. Um, and as you can see on this call, we're all very united on this front because we really care about our pets, our children, our elderly. And um, as I, I was the person that wrote the Harris, street hump, speed bump, speed hump, I think was better than speed bumps. And um, since then, I've had a lot of discussions with my neighbors about it. And I wanna ask you all as the transportation advisory committee to really look at what would be the best solution 
for um, this change in traffic patterns. It's obviously um, exacerbated by the fact that we now have the Mill District, all those apartment buildings up the street, there's a lot more traffic. They change the traffic patterns with a new light system. That's caused people, as other people have said, a lot of impatient people on Pine Street to come down our streets. Um, there's been other options explored out there, which could be like a dead end at the end of Harris and a dead end at the end of Fisher, so people cannot connect, but do up cars and maybe, um, sorry, bikes and people could walk through there. These are just ideas we're coming up with as random citizens that know nothing about civic engineering or planning. But I just wanted to request to you all that we're all here tonight because we really care about the people who live here. We don't want anybody to have any kind of accidents. And as Derek Shea has been in front of our yard many times yelling to get people to slow down, um, we really care about the people that are here and we wanna keep them here. So thank you for listening. Great, thanks to all of you. Um, and and Tra I, I, Tracy, we can't hear you. I'm sorry, so um, yes, I agree. Um, is there anybody else in the audience who would like to speak at this time? Um, go ahead, Janet. You need to unmute yourself. Or... Thank you, Tracy and members of the committee. I'd like to add to uh, briefly to what Meg said about the assets in North um, Amherst Village Center and, and um, talk a, a little bit about how that goes double now that we um, th that the pandemic is uh, somewhat waning and we have lively new businesses um, like Cisco's and Big Basket Market and more to come in North Square. And um, also Valley CDC is planning a new condo, um, new condo uh, in uh, development and um, affordable housing um, on Ball Lane. So um, a North Amherst Village uh, Valley bike uh, station at North Square would, with dedicated bikes, would make it very much easier for North Amherst residents and visit visitors to travel um, between uh, North Square and points along the route to the university and downtown. And we hope you'll support our request for $20,000 to match the private funds that have been pledged to make possible a dedicated bike um, station in North Am North Square. Um, and that would connect people to work, to local businesses, the library, the schools, the community conservation and recreation areas. And we really appreciate being with you tonight. And um, thank you for considering our request. Okay. Thank you. I will say, as I said at the front of this meeting, um, we are an advisory committee. This is not on our agenda tonight. We cannot take any action on it. Um, we appreciate hearing from you. Um, and as I said, I know a few of you came late, but um, you know we were told by the finance director and also Kathy Shane agreed with the finance director's recommendation that TAC not take any action or make any recommendations on any of the citizen requests until they come to us formally through like the town channels. So um, we appreciate hearing your comments, but I mean, that's basically, I mean, we are limited in what we can do and recommend. And I did, when May contacted me originally, I just send her an email just with my initial feedback based on my experience as a transportation planner and with my backgrounds. Um, they don't represent the comments of the committee, but there is information there, including about, you know, the difference between speed humps and speed bumps and speed tables and like all those variants. Um, so in part to like comment on what um, Scott said, right? That I think the language that Meg mentioned was speed bumps, but typically speed bumps are only those things that you see in like parking lots that are really like up and down. And that's not like typically how you refer to them, but but we appreciate you all coming to the meeting. So thank you. And um, I mean, I'm hoping that TAC does have an opportunity to weigh in and make recommendations and 
to see your proposals in full. So, um, I mean, Meg, if you do want to forward those to me, I can forward them to I, the committee. I, we I'd just hadn't re we just hadn't received them like officially. So. Well, and I sent an email to the to the whole committee several weeks ago. That was never we, sent to tax never. attention. Yeah. So I look, let me reread that and see if it's still relevant. But we did understand that you can't take a position, but your advisory. So we thought, and we were invited to. It's public comment, so that's that's what oh, we absolutely. understand. That's what this is. No, we understand. But thank you. Thank you Thanks all very everybody. much. We really appreciate it. I hope you all. I mean, we well. you know we are committed to supporting safety and right. more better access and more you know more friendly neighborhoods and all of those things and. I mean, we just also don't have any information on what the budget is like for all these requests and what other pressing requests might be out there in terms of transportation. Right. I mean, there is, of course, like many more capital requests that are coming before the town than the town has money for. So mm -hmm. but thank you. Well, the idea of resident, yes. I, you know, maybe none of them will be funded, but the idea was to give residents the opportunity to communicate needs that uh, the town may not be aware of. And that's what we're doing. You know, that's I, I'm. We're not NIMBYs. We're just trying to <laughs> represent. Uh, we're YIMBYs. <laughs> yes, no doubt. I mean, definitely, we hear the issues that you're bringing, right. and I mean, it's common for TAC to hear from right. residents of different neighborhoods about different right. issues. Great, thank you. Great. Thank so, you. Um, so thank you. Um, uh, we do have a lot of other business that we need to get, attend to. Um, so thank you all for your comments. I think this ends the public comment period. Um, and we do have some minutes that we have to approve. <laughs> um, did everyone receive those? Everyone on the committee receive those? Um, uh, they're from Thursday, October 20th and Thursday, November 17th. Um, does anyone want to um, make a motion? No, and um, and I apologize that I was having trouble sending them. I don't know what was going on with my email, but thank you, Kim, for sending them out. Yeah. I move to approve. Yeah. Um, are there any um, any other comments before we proceed? I, I mean, I second that. And I, and I guess one thing is that we probably only want the people who were. Um, yeah. Which is just, members to vote on those? Uh, and look, I mean, we just asked that people would abstain, but I'm hoping that they would yeah. do that. Well, we just because to, they weren't here. Yeah, we don't need to, but for meeting law, we don't need to direct their vote. So. No, of course. Um, okay, so I guess we'll just go ahead and if there are no other comments. Um, so um, all those in favor, raise your hand. So that's four of us. Um, and, four of us, yes. And um, so four uh, in favor, um, any abstain, any one, two, two abstain. And um, so that's everyone, right? Okay, mm -hmm. so there's no raise. Great, so those minutes have been approved. Thank you. And um, so the next um, item on the list is the annual review of the TAC priorities. Um, and I guess we were hoping that Guilford would be here. Guilford, <laughs> I don't so, know if Jason is prepared to do that, but he's run away. No, I mean I think yeah. as I as I was saying, um, I had tried to reach, I connect with Guilford last week, and I didn't manage to do that. And um, I mean, Jason very kindly attended our December fifteenth meeting, and we did run through the projects then. Um, but then, as we had talked about, right, we really want to see like Guilford's nice spreadsheet where he lists everything. Right. And we can review it in that context. Um, so I think we can go through the projects quickly, you know, in terms of our list, and we can see that stuff has um, continuing, you know, to a number of the projects that were on the email that I sent, you know, are in progress, which is great to see. And Jason gave us an update on some of those last time. Um, but I guess my feeling is that until Guilford until we look at that spreadsheet, we're not sure what other requests and things Guilford has had. So it always is always really valuable to do it with Guilford spreadsheet available. How I many do other people have thoughts on that? I think no, I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> I concur. So okay. Um so, I, do, yeah. I do have one go question. Ahead, Marcus. For Jason. Sure. Yeah, I have a question for Jason. I mean, it's on our agenda. Just 
uh, can we get an update on the Pomeroy village intersection? I mean, the work that's there has um, been done. Has it been finished? Oh, Pomeroy village. No, yeah. the intersection, they, they installed a few of the drains just before. Yeah, right. I just wondering really... if that work had been done. That was all, uh, complete, I should say. Yeah. No, well, they just got a few of the drains installed, what they what they could get in in time and what they could get in the ground before the asphalt plants closed. Mm -hmm. um, and then they just, you know, we told them to hold off for the, until the asphalt plants reopen and then they can restart. Um, yeah. they're, they're waiting on a pretty big granite order um, and, uh, and a bunch of other stuff. I think we're getting that pretty soon, though. So they should be ready to start back up again in March, cool. depending on when the uh, asphalt plants open. Mm -hmm. Well, and um, I mean, as we're going through these lists, um, get, I mean, I'm sorry, Jason. So I'd send you that email sort of late, actually, when the meeting started, because you hadn't received it. You had just received the agenda. But yeah. we had talked last time about the North Pleasant Street um, improvements at Kendrick. And you had thought that that's going to be on the work plan for the 2023 season. Yep. You know, we're including including most bit. of that, most of the redesign that had been talked about, including the sidewalk you know, the additional sidewalks and the crosswalks and the getting rid of the, the the grass buffer on the west side and the whole shebang, right? So, yep. so that's very exciting. <laughs> so, diagonal parking, counter flow by oh, lane, yeah. Uh, yeah, all that stuff. Well, that's, that's really exciting. Yeah. So, raised intersection at McClellan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pretty nice. We're only going from McClellan to Triangle. Yep. Right. And some other okay, ideas yeah. for the piece from, um, I guess you'd say Halleck to McClellan. Okay. If we could only stop people from going the wrong way. Uh, Is that still happening a lot? Got really? better. But... It's, it's happened a lot over break where there are no cars parked anymore. Yes. I oh. have noticed a huge, I bike there every day and I hadn't seen anyone do that in a while. And then all of a sudden it started mm -hmm. happening again. Yeah, when it's not constricted and, with and vehicles. It happens often. It's more right tempting. I also Can see we, residents who live on the yeah. street do it in very intentionally. Very intentionally. I stop out of their driveway and <laughs> take a light and they know yeah, where you're supposed to, but they don't care. Maybe is it, is it, like can we have some enforcement? Do we have any well, you know, just say, can we get the, connection the with police the car police? at the end? I have a little bit of that. They did do they did do it a few times for us. Um, yeah, I mean, isn't I, they getting to the end of the month? Don't they need to write a few more tickets? So, yeah, it wouldn't hurt to do a little bit more. What's yeah. very dangerous? What about yeah. a bump out of the curb? So, if you're coming from the north the wrong way, like there would be a curb in your way and, and doing them, making it orange. The large trucks can't make yeah. the turn. What if it's really low, but it's really visible? I suppose you could make it mountable, but that kills the counterflow bike lane. Yeah, that's so you can have a you have kind of, bike lane. Well, you can have, have it cut through for a bike, though. Good. Um, I'd have to look into that. We haven't incorporated anything with that in our design. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of some things that they do in Eugene, Oregon, that are kind of like that, that work really well to stop the wrong way traffic. Anyway, I have been encountering it often in the evening, so I don't know if it's difficult to see the signage at night. <laughs> I Where think people are just well, just. I was going to say, is it just residents wanting to come home quickly? Yeah. yeah. Well, and just Plenty of signage. Yeah, mm -hmm. just to recap, so Jason, so um, our new uh, tech member Joseph, he lives on or Joe. You go. Do you go by Joe or Joseph? Joe is fine. Sure. Um, but he lives on McClellan. Oh, okay. you! I live on Cosby. I'm your neighbor. Oh, hey. How you doing? I knew that you. Know, yeah. <laughs> This is Lucia. You've so, probably heard. You've probably heard this. I've heard. Yes, yeah, she's so cute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you know, you, Kim, you and Joe know what's going on there the most. Yeah, but, um, and no, it is. It, it's amazing too that all of that downtown parking demand just disappears when the students aren't it's there. Not, it's <laughs> just gone. And it's and I know, and I know that. I mean, Andy isn't here today, but like previously, Andy has mentioned that. Um, you know, the, those um, those spaces were designed, those permit parking spaces were designed for downtown workers. It's like pretty clear that that's not who uses exactly. them. Exactly. No, it's very <laughs> clear. Yeah. So anyway.
But that's cool. It'll be great one to have that. And maybe once it's once it's better, like you know, once it's actually designed, maybe that will stop people from going the wrong way. Yeah, um, it will help. No, yeah. it will be a huge help too. But I mean, if we do have any connection with the police, that would be it. I mean, maybe we can invite the police department to one of our future meetings and just talk about, you know, enforcement in general. Yeah. And the, I, you know, I call the them variable speed, frequency. the variable speed signs and like things like that. So, cool. um, okay. Um, well, we've talked previously about the North Pleasant Street, Eastman to Pine Street and, um, Chris Bressop had been here at one of our previous meetings. She had mentioned, I guess, our last meeting or one of them. And she had mentioned that um, they are looking at some like CDBG funds or something to do part of that area because it does qualify in terms of like having enough low income residents for that. But it wouldn't be that whole corridor. I don't know, Jason, where do you see that moving forward anytime well, soon? I know that the CDGB grants, partial CDG. Grants have or money has been sought. And we haven't had an answer. Okay. So it did go up as a question. Um, and, and I mean, that's a pretty go. big stretch too. And I know that there were questions about the funding and also. Right. We're doing it very, very. UMass, if you could get UMass to <laughs> contribute at all, since that's such like an important UMass corridor. But. Looking at a joint tip funded project here. Okay. At least the corridor through campus to improve sidewalks and bike lanes. Mm. I'm having a hard That's... time hearing Jason. Oh, do I need to lean in? Yeah, I, I can. Uh, yeah, I can hear you Sorry. okay though. But yeah, no. check my settings. I usually have to crank. I don't know what was with this. Um, this computer does not work great with my set. Uh, I have to jack up the volume like to the maximum for anybody to hear me. So I'll just try to um, lean in and speak speak more clearly. Yeah, that's fine. That's yeah. Cool. And um, so the joint tip project. So who would be the joint part of it? Would it be UMass and the town of Amherst? Or yeah, and okay. it would you know they would help with the right of way acquisition type stuff. Oh, got it. Okay. We'd have to widen. You know, the the right of way is not wide enough through campus to accommodate right. all the different users we want. You know, half of the well, sidewalks yeah, on UMass. And one of right. One of the things we noticed on our. I mean, we toured it a couple of times as a committee just to look at it when Guilford asked us for the feedback and that in some sections, um, particularly north of like um, North Village that it's like very, um, the sidewalk on the east side is like very narrow. Mm -hmm. And then it's even made more narrow by like overgrowth of like vegetation and like runoff and things that it's like this little kind of almost like goat path. And you can see that students are using it a lot Right. I mean, that's such a heavily traveled pedestrian corridor. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. so I know that there's not a lot of money for that, but what would it take for the town to just clean the road or make it more, uh, clean the footpath? I mean, you know, remove the debris off the footpath, cut back the um, vegetation so that it's actually accessible. I mean, without going and redoing it just as a temporary measure. I mean, that's well, something that, you know, you can go with a bobcat and do, right? Uh, not really a bobcat. When the, once the asphalt gets uneven, it's really hard to just, you know, it's, it's yeah, like yeah. dirt and mud that kind of falls mm -hmm. in and grass that overgrows it. The sidewalk plows do a decent job of a little bit of widening, but ultimately it's, it's really something you need to, and, and you Sounds really need to point. raise them up because they have over long periods of time they become the low spot right the road right. comes up every mm -hmm. time you pave it and the, mm -hmm. the, the sidewalk unfortunately becomes sort of a weird paved gutter that may be offset yeah. from the road so i was um, just thinking about like a temporary measure just at least clean it off but if you're you know if you're actually requiring people to go in there with a spade then it's not potentially well, the, yeah um, the other thing I would like to see, Guilford had brought this up at one of the meetings, is when I was talking about, for example, along Belcher Town Road, that sometimes there's still a lot of grit and things on the sidewalk after the winter, is that it is actually the property owner's responsibility not to clean only snow and ice, but also to clean like, you know, sand and stuff too. 
and and of course to do the correct. vegetation i mean i do have a mm -hmm. few neighbors like on amity who insist that there's no way that they can cut back their bushes that are like taking up half the sidewalk um mm -hmm. but i mean it really they have that responsibility and it has to be like accessible and so i would love to see yeah. like um a like public information campaign i, I mean the town has done that a little bit about the snow mm -hmm. but also I mean, I wasn't aware that it also extended to like, and of course, vegetation, but also, mm -hmm. you know, just about making sure and that it, <laughs> you're like, you're responsible for that part in front of your house, you know, so. Love to see enforcement if there was any way we could actually yeah start sending out letters and even so Jason, you know, fines. What, what would make that more possible, either enforcement or an educational campaign? We would need some sort of an enforcement agent. We don't. That's not something we have in house. I mean, there's there's zoning enforcement at town hall. There's police. There's parking. Um, for some of the snow enforcement, we did for a short while have the assistance of um, the parking folks, um, but that was a very brief period, and I'm not exactly sure why that dried up. Although we haven't had a whole lot of snow either, so. No. Well, and, and you know, what, Guilford, Guilford had volunteered at like some of the past meetings, including like the GOL meetings, because mm -hmm. they've been revealing the snow and ice bylaw in my request. Mm -hmm. But that um, that DPW could, you know, if that power was given to DPW, that they could assist with um, snow and ice, like in the bylaw enforcement. Right. And things um and he mentioned how like when he came to amherst like he was given like a ticket book and that you could hypothetically write tickets it's that, i mean that power mm -hmm. does not rest with dpw right now the current bylaw says it's only the police that enforce it right but um but that could be definitely i'd like to see it expanded just beyond snow and ice because i mean, I mean we haven't had a big winter but it is a general yeah. issue just in terms of the vegetation and everything yeah i, mean, I think i I think another way maybe of getting ar around this issue too, and something I've had some success with is getting um, delinquent landlords to do things by writing things. There's a, um, a rental like site on, on the, t at, at the town, I forgot what it's called, but you can flag certain yeah, houses for doing things like leaving their trash out, having too many mm -hmm. cars parked. And I would imagine for not shoveling as well. So, yes. so that's definitely, and, and, and landowners, I mean, rental rent people who rent landlords definitely don't want those violations on their properties. So, so how, my my question is, how does this happen systematically? Because so far, it seems like we have this system where someone just like makes a single complaint and maybe one bush gets trimmed or one little stretch gets trimmed. But what we need yes. for a really robust pedestrian network and a working bicycle network that works, you know, at least 10 months a year is for this to just happen. So how do we how do we have a system where that just happens? Who does it? And yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, so that was one of the things that GOL was looking at too, like with snow and ice about whether to extend some of it to like in the inspection department, you know, beyond the police department, because currently yes. it's all police, but to extend it to DPW or inspection or whatever. So I would, I would agree that it would be nice to see it be more robust. So it could very easily be someone's full-time job. And that's, yeah. uh, unfortunately, there's no, there's nobody that's got. <laughs> no, right. For full -time sure. To just yes, do that, sir. which um, is where I would sure. hope that like um, a public information, like a campaign, would like yeah. encourage people to do the right thing, since we're never going to have that person. I bet people don't know. Yeah, I disagree exactly. with that, yeah. that concept of like a hundred percent enforcement without you know some effort. Again, to Eve's point, in a systematic way, educating people, like a mailing. I know a mailing to everybody mm -hmm. probably costs. I can't even imagine how much it costs, you know, twelve or fifteen thousand dollars. But if it's in the budget and you're doing it once a year, um, you're at least educating everybody, addressing the fact that we have a lot of turnover, um, and helping everybody realize their own um, obligations. Well, um, we do, yeah. And I feel like that's just as important as. Um, you know, the education piece in a systematic way happening as the enforcement. 
I mean, and there are things that go out, you know, from the town periodically that I know sometimes like the council on aging will pay back on it. Like in terms of, right, we get the water sewer bills and we get like property tax things. And sometimes there's like inserts in there. Um, or, no, if we, you know, or, if, or if we ask for some, you know, PR. Yeah. So you do robust warning ticketing, you know. Right. Oh, of course. Yeah. Sorry. I, I, I live in a rented unit from a very frugal landlord. Uh, he would respond, but he would not be very pleased if he received a, a ticket. <laughs> I mean, in Philly, everyone just did it because it be, cleared their property, you know, their sidewalk, because otherwise you get sued by you. Someone would trip and get sued. So mm -hmm. everybody, it was almost universally people just shoveled and cleared because right. of litigiousness, you know, which we don't have here, thankfully, but. Yeah, I, mean, I think, I think we need to do some PR on that. So, I mean, I can bring that up to, to um, TSO. The town services and outreach. I mean, typically TAC items go to them, but also they are like the town services and outreach committee, like in terms of PR on this. So, right, and um, and it's not it's not even the whole town, right? Because not everybody has a sidewalk, or no, you know, for sure, most people don't have sidewalks. In fact, so <laughs> yeah, okay. So just moving through this list again, some of this we talked about with Jason at that December meeting, but um, excuse me, I have a bit of a cold. Um, um, so East Pleasant, when we talked about it before, Jason, you had mentioned that there's like a huge right away there and you oh, yeah. didn't think because of that, you didn't think it would be difficult to actually do some of that sidewalk at addition. Right. Like over it's just the long a matter of which side it goes on and mm -hmm. which it's sort of a matter of like there's going to be some trees that need to go to accommodate it mm -hmm. and we try to we try to avoid as many as possible especially the significant right. ones but yeah we yes, have a survey it, and we're is the survey done yeah survey's done it's in our hands we just need time oh that's fantastic we need time and bodies to to start looking at it but oh that's, that's fantastic that's i was part of, of a neighborhood group that talked to neighborhood people I, i'm in one of the side neighborhoods along that stretch and yeah. Um, the neighborhood people and the people on East Pleasant really felt like we needed a sidewalk on both sides because it's a pretty treacherous street to cross. And what we want is for, right. you know, kids and elderly to be able to walk. And so it's just, mm -hmm. it's not viable. Um, and, right. and another thing is, you know, to look, look carefully at the bus stops and whether there could be ways to have landings at the bus stops and cross at the bus stops. Mm -hmm. Anyway. For yeah. sure um what is so, so basically as you're able you're going to start sort of playing around with kind of initial designs is that the idea yeah yeah we've we're, we're piled pretty high right now but we, we everything's got once we have a survey that's a huge step to towards the next step so right oh so yeah as soon as we get our heads above water we can start doing another design but we keep getting we get a lot New of projects i know there's a lot of projects that yeah. take up all our design time Mm -hmm. or other grant you know and it's a lot of it's grant money and i understand you gotta if you get grant money you gotta spend it so you gotta finish the designs and finish those when there's no actual money it, it's it's it gets side burnered a lot well like pomeroy right i mean the pomeroy mm -hmm. project has to be finished because yes because we got grant that money is gotta <laughs> yeah. still don't have all our easements in place got it um and then the pedestrian access to Groff Park, I mean, it's seen, that's the next one on our list, you know, that we'd identified before. I mean, it seems like that's pretty much done. done isn't that's that? totally done. There's, that's, that's awesome. We have one nasty gram that out to Verizon, they need to trim. They've got a, a, a guy wire that kind of would get you in the forehead if you were oh. walking too, if you were biking, especially on the sidewalk, you'd probably catch it in the forehead. But they, it's a diagonal guy wire and they have these arms that they put on and and Eversource did their part. So there's a guy wire for Eversource and then there's a guy wire for Verizon. Eversource can move theirs, but they can't touch Verizon's. And Verizon, once Eversource does theirs, Verizon is supposed to get a note that says, go do yours. And those inter-utility communications are horrible. And now, so where is that located? Which part of it uh, is it? It's the last pole before the entrance to Graf Park. Oh, okay, on Millie. 
Yeah, if I had a now, car that was ready for the graveyard, I might just drive through it. <laughs> wow. So the other thing there is that I don't think that people always realize that that little pedestrian bridge that's like near that home. Yeah. Like that's actually like a public bridge. We've but there's a place. crosswalk to it, so there ha it has to be. I just yeah, feel we, like people don't. I mean, it looks like it's like part of their house, sort of. I just. <laughs> we and then that signage over there. Oh, okay. yeah, says, oh, yeah, yeah. You could. We we have two signs. We have we have signs that say public access, and we have a oh, sign, okay. a second sign that says, "Please be respectful to private landowners." Oh. Yeah, it is an easement across their property, and you don't want people like. Well, know. and then the main bridge, like on 116, right, it's got that like super rusted out railing and things still. So, yes. no, I mean, it's nice that you can take that pedestrian bridge, but yeah. You yeah, maybe that's something. That rusted out railing. Oh, excellent. So, yeah. um, and then, um, let's see. So, and so one thing we had talked about, I mean, the um, committee, the next one on our list was Pot Wine and West Street. So, Previously, TAC has just talked about and Guilford to uh, just about having like a multiple, like a series of small roundabouts at like different intersections, right? Going along south, you know, 116, going towards the notch, right? The in between, yeah. and possibly having a roundabout at that intersection at yeah, the pot, we, at pot line. We've done a few concepts on that, just. One's got splitter island, one's got this, one's got that. Um, actually, PVTA came up with some grant money to put oh. in actual bus stops there. Oh, that's wow. great. Um, it's not a whole lot of money. Um, it's sort of a blessing in disguise. <laughs> um, so I think what we're gonna we're gonna work on another concept. It's not the whole kit and caboodle, but we're gonna move the bus stops a little farther north. And they okay. currently are. It gives us a little bit more space, and then and the, and it gets us away from a wetland. There's one side that's got grading issues. One side's got a wetland. The Hampshire College side has a wetland. The Potwine Lane side has a very steep mm -hmm. drop off. If we move them a little farther north, uh, a little closer to is that Glendale Road, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if we move them a little closer to Glendale, um, we have a little bit more space. We don't have to deal with the grading or the wetland. Uh, and we can u utilize the PVTA funds appropriately. Um, I don't, I think we still need a little more money on top of it, but right. it still works. And I think we would ex just extend a short side, we'd put a crosswalk in, extend a short sidewalk down to Potwine Lane and just have it end at Potwine uh, to connect cool. that. And I think it's, it's a small improvement, but it's an improvement overall. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be a big improvement. That's awesome. I mean, um, I mean, I think, you know, the issue of having a crosswalk there because there is the bus stop on both sides and then also just the high use of the pot wine fields. Yeah. Right. That um, yeah. that comes up a lot. It's just I mean, somebody had emailed me, said, well, you know, crosswalks are you just put down a bunch of lines. And I was like, well, you have to make sure they're safe. <laughs> you can't yeah. particularly like on the state road because. it. Yeah. Oh, no, it's actually a town road right up to That's the notch. Town. Is that right? Yes. But um, but. But you, I mean, I, I don't feel comfortable with the whole just like, you know, put down some lines on the road and it's a crosswalk because you just have to make sure that it's going to be safe. <laughs> well, the biggest but, consideration, for, the biggest consideration for crosswalks are the visually impaired. And if you put a crosswalk to nowhere, you've just stranded a blind person in the middle of nowhere. Like there has to be sidewalk on both sides of the road to have a legit crosswalk. Um, otherwise, you're just leaving yourself open for huge problems. Jason, I thought I remembered you talking years, not years, but two or three years ago about the Northampton study of, I forget which one it was, but it was like Northampton and Hampshire County bike and ped planning or something. And mm -hmm. they talked about a way that you could have a crosswalk that goes across to a street, you know, and I thought you were the one who like brought it up in one of our meetings and said it might be possible. I've had ADA classes since then that say absolutely not. Uh, you have to have the tactile strip that for, for visually impaired, you have to have visual contrast for less visually impaired. And there has to be a route that someone, if you know, if they're say they're using the directional cane, 
they have to be able to feel the edge of this and feel the edge of that and have some guidance to stay on a roof. Um, don't know of any good ways around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was at um, an ADA curb ramp and pedestrian like route class last week that was like being run by for a um, mass DOT and um, the presenter was Ted Green who like does stuff with the New Jersey like LTAP but he also he just has a lot of like ADA awareness stuff for facilities planning in general and I mean he did show examples in cases like where you could have a crosswalk like even if you don't have sidewalks and stuff adjacent you know particularly if the municipalities thought that they might have a sidewalk later or something but i agree that there are some problems with it for I sure think the sidewalk later thing is a is a trick no i know i just <laughs> I mean, um, he, you know, he gave a lot. We went through like a lot of examples about how some places will do it and so on. But, but I can see how that's. I mean, that that has come up to. Well, I mean, the donor requests, which haven't been shared, but that was one of the things that they wanted to have a crosswalk to like a side of the street that doesn't have a sidewalk or anything. Or so. Yeah. Speaking of the donor request, I was curious, Jason, what you thought of their idea of having a um. The dead ends where the where Fisher and Harris meet. I'm guessing you'll probably say you need to have a way for emergency vehicles. So, like, okay, what if we do it in a way that emergency vehicles could could go over? Uh, uh, hang on, I don't think we can talk about. Yeah, that. I don't want we to go back. To talk about <laughs> that. Oh, we can't. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. No, yeah, we'll go. But that was one of the. I know that that's one of their requests too. About I just wondered about the feasibility of that at all. But anyway. Yeah, so. I know, but we've been told not to talk about it. Yeah. So. So no, I agree. I I apologize. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay. And what was? And the so last, I think that was the, the last one was about, and this has come up a number of times. I think the TAC discussed it before I was on the TAC, but just about redesigning South Amherst yeah. Common. We've done a lot. And how? I mean, I I think that DPW did have a plan once, right, to make some sections of it one way and improve the sight lines and things, and then. Hang on our wall in the engineering office. Beautiful work of art. Um, <laughs> oh, really? We should. You should. You, we should revisit it again. I mean, I've been involved with TAC for four, uh, two, three and a half years now, and I've never seen it. But um, about ten years ago, we proposed okay. it. There was a lot of very embedded residents who. I'll I'll just do a direct quote that was that was um, very loudly shouted, don't change anything, just stop the speeding. Not that, that easy. Of, we left that meeting just with our tail between our legs and just like flaming pitchforks and torches at our backs. Um, it was horrible, but there has been a lot of um, property sales yeah um, in that area a lot of houses have changed hands i would mm -hmm. be willing to try for that design again yeah well and i mean i have one suggestion i mean that that... Maybe, this, maybe this happened before your time tracy i'm sure kim you remember but but guilford brought us that design and and we came up with a plan and a recommendation to do some was it some traffic studies kim do yes, you remember but it was traffic studies, but then COVID, then right, it was right. like, but there was actually a plan for a couple seasons and then yeah. COVID happened and then everything, yeah. you know. And, and the there was going to be like some way where shades would be one way, but no, not for emergency vehicles. There, there were some specific things that were in mm. a really limited plan that was going to be studied yeah. um, that, that the TAC did develop with Guilford. Right. And because we also had a number like of, of public outreach, even down there, right at the at the library down there, too. I mean, it seemed yeah. unlike your experience, Jason, it seemed <laughs> yeah, there was like, a lot of support at that. Time. Again, this was maybe four, three or four years ago. It seemed like there was support, like more so. support. Yeah, yeah, I think there is more support now. I mean, I guess the other, I guess one suggestion is, and I could phrase it like with the district five counselors is maybe that, you know, if that's something that the 
the district five counselors are interested in like that's something that could be kind of looked at more or something like if they feel like there's going to be support for it um the reason the traffic studies couldn't go forward with COVID is because there was no more traffic right, right. There, there were was no, no students yeah. right. so the whole right. idea is once we have students back to to yeah that that it seems like right. that study that plan could be brought back it was a pretty modest plan that wasn't as ambitious as that one that I think you had that experience yeah, with original yeah yeah, well, that that can be. I I can ask them, or if you know, well, we don't have any members in District Five, but well, ask they do, about it. He'll remember. They yeah. do have. Um, yeah, we could. Um, we could bring it up there too. Again, but as you it, said, Jason, I mean, you guys do already have a lot of <laughs> current projects, but mm -hmm. um, but that could be something that you know can come back to the town like in a future year. Right. Um. Well, thank you. So. Um. So we don't have Guilford here to go over his spreadsheet, but it's nice to recap these main projects. And um, I think if Guilford, if we can't get Guilford to the next meeting, we can, you know, go through his list as well and see if there's anything we want to add in terms of like what we think are priorities. But I mean, do we, I mean, I, I feel like this list is a pretty good list. I don't know if there's anything we think are, is missing. But, yeah, no, and, and what's nice is to see the progress, you know, or right. I mean, I was pretty excited to see that we've made a bunch of progress on that. Yeah, so, so can I reel back just real quickly to the North Pleasant Street, the sort of multi use path and sidewalks? Yeah, there's one very short, short stretch of this that we're going to squeeze into our um, sidewalk projects this summer, and that's okay. Um, I'm to describe it's right across the street from. That's where Harris Street comes into North Pleasant Street. Uh -huh. um, there's okay. a weird little spur. Oh, right. Yeah. And it's sort of a shared driveway, but it's technically a town right of way. Um, we call it old, old North North Pleasant Street just because we already have an old North Pleasant Street. Oh, right. This one's yeah. further north. Yeah. But um, so we had to we had to throw probably 10 tons of asphalt at that road before the winter, just because the potholes were getting so bad. Um, so we did that, we still have to plow it. It's still technically our jurisdiction. Um, so at that point we were, we decided, Guilford decided that, okay, we can afford to do this little stretch. We'll do the multi-use path, we'll relocate the bus pull off and we'll create three individual driveways that lead out to the road that will oh, you know, cool. be the homeowner's responsibilities. Right. Um, we'll we'll have a better bus pull off, better access, better sidewalk. It's I don't know. Is that maybe a five hundred foot stretch? Maybe a little. Long? It's probably you know it's probably closer to eight hundred or a thousand foot stretch. Um, so we're working on that. We're gonna we're gonna oh. throw that out there. We're gonna eliminate the, the old spur of the road. We'll extend the driveways, relocate the bus stop. The bus uh, stop pushes a little further south. Um, and that gives it a little bit more room to actually pull out of the road. Um, so it's a nice little improvement. It's a nice bite-sized piece of the budget we can mm -hmm. do. Um, nice. So it, it's and it, and and sometimes stuff like that spurs interest in the rest of the project. They, they see an eight-foot-wide multi-use sidewalk uh, that's only a thousand feet long, and they're like, "Why wouldn't you continue that?" <laughs> cool. Great. So yeah, tasty. so we saw that spur. I guess I never really noticed it before until we did like our site walk. Yeah. But um there's tons of little quirky things like that in this town. Yeah. So um, but thank you. Thank you. Um so that, for those recaps. So that has been done? Like parts of it have been done? No, no, no. We're they're, they're gonna put it in the work it. plan we're, for we're, this coming we had year. A conceptual, you know, we have that conceptual multi-use path design from Eastman all the way to Pine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. still very conceptual. Yeah, we yeah, yeah. we sat down with that conceptual plan and started working with grading and trees and actual driveways and it completely changed. It's close to the original concept. But it it's uh it's better it's more improved it it works better it avoids some of the bigger more significant trees. Uh, so it, when was the last time? So we walked that in probably like a year ago or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, have you updated since then? Continued like to update the plans or no? The original okay. conceptual plan is still what it was. We just took this little bite-sized piece out. Oh no, no, I understand. Okay. Okay, now we have to actually implement right. this, and we started. Then when you start looking at drainage, you start looking at right. trees. Um, you start looking at the smaller details: grading, drainage, trees, all that fun stuff. Yeah. And you're like, ooh, 
we're going to create a giant puddle here if we don't move this here and you know, we got to take out that beautiful maple no sure uh, otherwise yeah we shift over here you know that sort of stuff the conceptual stuff is the broad brush strokes and and you just kind of ram a 10 foot path down a three foot lane and and that's your conceptual idea but right well then, yeah so when we did the walk like Gil, um gilford had shared with us um like had drawings or whatever of the whole like mm -hmm. the plans like the six yeah. pages of the plans or whatever so you know we marked those up in detail but well, that's great to hear that we're going ahead so okay um okay so then i i guess we'll move on just for these other updates and we don't have andy here to um if there were any updates from the TSO. tso and i guess i don't think the tso is meeting this week but um i haven't heard so i did put the gol review of the snow and ice spy law on here because typically GOL meets like every other Wednesday. And so I What's thought there might GOL? be an update. So GOL is the um, like government ordinance legislation oh. um, a committee. And they like basically review like bylaws and make sure that they like pass muster. And so the past council, including um, with the past council, there had been a committee including with Bernie Kubiak, who was on it, who had previously been on the TAC. And like, they went through like all the bylaws and they tried to like clean them up. And this one was left, um, including because there were some questions about the list of the streets that as a courtesy, the town would currently plow, like when they, the sidewalks when they can, but not always. And does the end so now some homeowners think that they don't have any responsibility to plow and things like that. And should there be any changes to the bylaw because of that? I had also I had also brought up um, just just the issue about enforcement about, you know, sh you know, because I think it's really I don't know how much enforcement actually happens right now um, with the police department. It's hard to sort of make a request <laughs> for enforcement. You know, I ended up having to call like what I was told is to call the police dispatch line and just to like clarify that process. And then some of the GOM members had suggested, oh, well, maybe, you know, and Guilford had offered like maybe DPW could help with enforcement or maybe inspection could help. One GOL member suggested, and the, the GOL members are all members of the council because it's a council committee who review things before it comes to the full council. Um, and somebody said, well, maybe Crest could do it or things like that. So it's still going back to GOL. It's just GOL has also had a lot of other stuff on their plate. So I'm assuming that GOL will be meeting again, you know, in the next, either next week or the week after. I did reach out to the GOL chair person, Michelle Miller, and I haven't heard back. Um, and then I also just had this recap of the District 4 nighttime pedestrian safety walk with the town manager. So it was organized by the District 4 counselors, um, Pam Rooney and um, Anika Lopes. And it was it was not super attended. It was going to be a really rainy night. Um, but we walked from Kendrick Park like up to Strong Street and back. We did get some nice coverage of it. Um, Western Mass News was there. There was like a video done and um, and we had like, there was a nice article written. I can share those links. Um, one idea they talked about is one, having other walks in the District 4 area, but then also um, maybe, you know, encouraging such walks at night in other districts as well. Um, like along pedestrian corridors, because it is just so informative to have those. Um, there were a few things that came out of that walk, um, which I attended. One was just noting that at the PBTA bus shelters, like that there's no light. Um, and even the one along East Pleasant Street, like if you didn't know, and there's not any street lights near that either. So if you didn't know that that bus shelter was there, you know, you might not know that that was a bus stop in the dark um, and also just along that section of East Pleasant Street where there's like a steep area where um, on the west side of the street where those those there's those really steep roads that go up to like you know the overlook <laughs> sort of mm -hmm. like overlooking the Chancellor's house there's a two different streets and now some people get confused about Mount Pleasant, Pokeberry Pokeberry. and what's the other one Mount Pleasant 
and not pleasant, right? And and also just the difficulty when you come down from those about turning like left out of them if the sight lines are bad and um and how some pedestrians when they're walking along East Pleasant Street and they get to that one section um that they assume that like they need to walk down to the road like when they hit Pokeberry I guess yeah and that you but you're actually supposed to walk on that tiny street that goes like past a bunch of the garages. <laughs> And to clarify some of that, um, but just in terms of the slope there, because there is a section that has a railing, but then there's a section without a railing. And it can be really dark. So one of the things that TV crew did when they were filming it is, of course, it was all lit up because there was a TV crew. But then in the middle of it, they turned off their camera, like they turned off the light for their camera. and You could see like how dark it is, um, which is pretty telling. So I do hope that there will be some other um, such walks around um such walks around different neighborhoods so and um and we don't have any other other updates from the council or tso i just, or I just put a little comment in the chat um just your remind your, your mention about the light made me wonder if that location that you're talking about on north pleasant um there could be a light added because when we did the north pleasant walk whatever that was five years ago one of the things we said is there's not enough light and there's so many students that walk on that corridor. It would be a great place to add lights. And I know lights in this town, there's a lot of discussion. People are worried about light pollution. Guilford's told us that there's sort of new kinds of lights that are kind of lower. They point down, they're LED. Like, is that a place where you could add one of those to sort of try it out and, and see how it works? Yeah. About on Old North Pleasant Street? Yeah. The section old, where old we're doing North Pleasant Street, right? <laughs> yeah. So we're so next to Kendrick Park, where it's a we have a full lighting plan. Oh, I actually meant the the old old North Pleasant Street, the one oh, the one like there. going up to Pine. Yeah, we don't have any lighting planned for that. Um, and there's no well, no, we have a control box not too far. The, the source of power is always tricky um, when you're not near a signalized intersection. Uh, but that is near a signalized intersection, and we could consider it. Just not something we really budgeted for in this small chunk we're doing. Yeah, I don't know how expensive those are. It's just since since the lighting has been such a point of contention, it seems right. like it would be great to just get one out there for people to sort of see how it looks. Well, one of the things that I like what PBTA does is they have these little solar powered lights that they place at the bus shelter. Even 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 if there's not a shelter, sometimes they'll still put a, it's like a little LED solar powered light. And it somehow has the bus schedules on it as well. So it gives you the schedule for that particular bus route and lights up the, it's it's not a bright, bright light, but it's it's decent. At least it's, you know, you're not standing in the pitch dark. Yeah, I mean, but, what we were really talking about is a light that would be bright yeah. enough and the intervals would be close enough that someone can bike at night, you know, when they're moving right. a little bit faster. And, yeah. and not have total shadow in front of them. Mm -hmm. But that seems like that's what brings up the contention in town where people are like, light pollution, and other people are like, safety. Um, mm -hmm. And so- yeah, It's a tough one to navigate. But yeah. that's why I was thinking like an example of what you guys think might be able to be both. It, anyway, it doesn't have to be there, but there's, right. uh, there's an opportunity for a trial location in a normally dark place. It could be great. It's a good point. Yeah. I'm, I mean, so I, I'll just mention just like with my own interest and also in part because of the street lights, proposed street lights bylaw from um, Councillors Haneke and Devlin Gothier that were proposing, um, you know, to maybe significantly turn up, turn off a number of street lights in town. Like I have been looking a lot at um, like best practices for, um, lighting at night and how you can have lighting that's compatible with dark skies and I think like Flagstaff Arizona which is like I think the first designated dark skies community has like good practices on that and things like that I mean so I'm happy to share some of that information if that's something that the town ends up doing more of um and I know I mean the bylaw that proposed bylaw which hasn't come back out of TSO yet but that um there were two parts of it and one had to, was looking at the actual lighting fixtures themselves and then the second part was where should lighting be um so anyway 
But I, so one thing that had come up and, and it came up on the walk that this district four walk is that with some of the new utility poles that Eversource put in, like they, right, they have this, they had the shorter poles. And then in a lot of neighborhoods, they, or streets, they put in those taller poles is that when the taller poles went in, the um, street lights were moved um, higher, like away from the roadway as well, um, which actually can, I don't see a lot of like safety benefit of that, but it, and it can increase glare and sort of spread. But Guilford, do you know, I mean, Jason, do you know anything about sort of why that was done or are there other options with that or? Don't know, that's a really tricky one. They didn't even, whoever they hired for a subcontractor was not paid to relocate or reset the Cobra headlights. Okay. So in, in many instances, they duct tape, they took the Cobra head down, put up the new pole, and they would duct tape the Cobra head to the pole, unwired, un Ew. dismantled and unwired to leave for our electrician, who then had to get with Eversource to to install and energize them. So okay. it was it, it was well, it was a complete afterthought in, in their uh, whole replacement project. I'll and I was that. told actually that in some places like <laughs> it it ended up being like DPW he came out and they're the ones who actually installed the is that what you're saying that their yeah, DPW is the ones who installed, the installed them but then the it was also mentioned to me hired. that there's some something about like how how much like real estate if you will that the town could use on the pole or something yes, and that's part of section. why they were moving yeah, up we can only be and... between here and here this is you know this belongs to electric this belongs uh, to us this belongs to cable this belongs to phone okay i just Got it. Yeah, there, there is only one section of the pole we're allowed to use. Oh. We don't have, there's no flexibility. But it just seems that, I mean, in a number of places, like where the new poles went in and then the street lights went up taller, like there yeah, are people who are complaining about. dimmed the light, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. It washed out. We're also just that it's more going into like people's, you know, upper story windows or that right. kind of stuff. But so there's nothing really that the town can do about that, I guess. It sounds I don't, like I mean, I suppose the only thing you could really look at is you could look at the specific fixture and specific okay. lenses because they have these magnification <laughs> lenses that you can you can you can change the bulb to a slightly different bulb style oh, okay. or spread, and then you can change the lens so that it has either uh, you know you can get lenses that do a perfect circle, you get lenses right. that do like an oblong oval. And they can the oval can be in the, this direction or that direction so there's options it's just systematically yeah, doing it takes a lot of time and oh just, for and cost and i mean everything i think that, that was one thing duct taping them to the poles was like what they, they didn't even tell us that was well, and there happen. are like hundreds of i mean the last street lights inventory i saw that there's like hundreds of street lights in amherst right mm -hmm. so oh yeah there's a lot i mean um but anyway, so I am. Um, I just wanted to draw people's attention in case people didn't see it that Joe did put a note in the chat just about um, Amherst College, like doing similar, like nighttime walks, which is a great thing. That's okay. great to hear. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know just you know when I've heard the comments about concerns about light pollution in Amherst, including at the TSO meeting, that I'm always struck by like the Amherst College seems like they do a pretty good job of having light fixtures and a lighting plan at night that. Is really localized lighting and that you know if you look at contrast at like the umass campus and i know um james lowenthal came to like one of the tso meetings and presented but i mean you know that umass is so lit up at night i mean i have friends who live like in hatfield or other places across the connecticut and they can see umass like i'm sure umass mm -hmm. can be seen for oh, yeah. many many miles right and so you don't get that at amherst college at all which is really to Amherst College credit, though the fields that are on Route Nine on Northampton Road sometimes those are on all night. Which I'm not um, sure yeah. why that has to be. <laughs> well, I mean, I I went through a similar process at Georgia Tech. Was part of the of the group that did the walks. Did the okay. I mean, the at those at least on the state college campuses, they're basically looking to make it as visible as it possibly is, so that you can see anybody around you right um and for safety's sake for purely for safety's sake and so 
they were certainly looking way back when when I did it um, to increase as much, you know, to provide as much lighting as possible for that sort of right. situation. So it, there may be a difference in philosophy between the private and the state colleges. Sure. You know? Yeah, but it is. I feel like some oh, of the uh, Kim, best... we can't hear you. Sorry. I was going to say, and the Bucks, right? I mean, yeah. Mass doesn't have Amherst College got plenty of. So. Yeah. Yeah, I I feel like UMass it's a little overkill. But, I mean, all night long it's like very bright, like all of campus. But yes, I this is it's a it's a, it's a recognition of the fact that you know grad students or anybody undergrads walk around at two in the morning and they okay. want to feel safe, and you don't feel safe when it's twilight. I mean, I, I think there's a balance, right? Anyway. Um, but, I'm just uh, reminding everyone that our meeting is yeah. going to end shortly. No, so, I think that's good. Um, okay, so, so in terms of our next meeting, do we want to? I'm not sure, unfortunately, like when the next TSO meeting is because they normally have a schedule, but I haven't seen their new schedule. Um, I mean, we typically try to meet like twice a month or so. And so we could decide to have our next meeting. Um, on February 2nd or we could wait until the 9th and then it will be like school vacation week. I mean, what do people and February is a short month too. So are so. you suggesting February 9th or what are you suggesting? Well, I guess I mean, I feel like, you know, February 9th, which would be three weeks that maybe that makes sense. Yes, I can. I agree with that. But then we probably wouldn't meet then, you know, two weeks after that, because four. then it would be like school vacation week. Right. So maybe we just have one meeting in February. Do you guys yeah. think that that makes sense? Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have not been getting any referrals or anything from yeah. TSO. So I feel That's like. Fine. I mean, okay. just as so long as we can get, find a date that Guilford can make. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. So why don't Sorry, I, Jason. I will reach out to Guilford. <laughs> I mean, if Guilford can't make the ninth, do we want to say the 16th then? Sure. Yeah, why not? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But let's All try right. for the ninth and then do the 16th. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And I know, unfortunately, like, um, can't, I mean, um, Christine <sighs> typically needs to leave at 630. So unfortunately, she left before you had time to talk about it. Um, but if we, <laughs> maybe if we could play like with the, um, like the starting time or something. I feel like she has an ongoing conflict where she had needs to leave by 630. Yeah. So yeah, that's fine. We can just I mean, so maybe some meetings, you know, we could meet at five or something, unless that's too much of a conflict for people. Sure. So I think that could okay. be okay. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Yeah. See you guys. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Kate. All right. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat>